Welcome to the Adventures in Awareness podcast, uh, discussions about perception, meditation, consciousness, and reality. And in this session, I'm super happy to have Richard Lang with us. Richard is almost certainly the world's foremost proponent of Headless Way, a kind of self-inquiry approach that is based on the first-person experiments originally devised by philosopher Douglas Harding. So welcome, Richard. A pleasure to be here, Amir. Wonderful. Great. Great. Um, I just want to add as well, if anyone's interested in following up on what we discussed, Richard has a website at headless.org. Um, and there's also a series of really beautiful guided, would you call them contemplations, the one on Sam Harris's app? Yes. Experiments, contemplations, yeah. On the Waking Up app, as well as on the headless.org. Um, and Richard has a really beautiful interview he does with Sam Harris, uh, which you can find online. So I'm hoping to cover slightly different territory because that was such a beautiful interview. Um, but maybe if it's okay, we can, just for anyone that hasn't already experienced the headless approach, we can start with uh, what's unique about it in terms of all the different ways humans have attempted to look at this question of who am I, right? There's kind of religious traditions and philosophical traditions and scientific traditions. And then the headless way approach strikes me as incredibly unique and original inside all those options. And then maybe a couple of they don't take long and they're always so fun. Yes. So would you like me to um, introduce a listener to an experiment or two? Is that or something like that? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Headless Way is an inquiry into what you are uh, and it is looking at what you are from your own point of view as opposed to what other people see. What other people see uh, depends on their range actually. At six feet you might be a person or you are a person but closer to your cells or molecules or atoms. You're like an onion with layers. Further away, of course, you might be, you're a country or the planet, the star. So you've got layers like an onion, and this is verifiable. And the question that I'm asking is, what is at the center of all these layers? So that's a modern scientific way of framing the ancient question, who am I, what am I? And it's important to ask this question, first of all, just if you're interested in living from the truth rather than just convention. And it makes a difference to live from the truth, because if you are wrong about who you are at center, that's going to affect all your life. And uh, also the great mystics have said that at your center is a wonderful treasure. And to live without being aware of this is to live in a kind of dream and is to miss out on something fantastic. So there are some reasons for looking. And the approach of the headless way is to say, well, uh, okay, there's this hypothesis that you're not what you look like at center, you're different from what you are, say from six feet. And the great mystics tell us at center, we're a sort of awake nothingness full of everything or stillness or awareness or timeless true nature, all of this. And the headless way says, well, let's not believe this. Let's check it out for ourselves and look for ourselves. And it's very scientific in the sense that if you want to find out, uh, you know, how, how many, uh, I don't know, petals a, a flower has, you count them, you look, you don't. Uh, debate about it, you look. And the same with this, if you want to find out what you are, instead of debating about it, you look. And the simplest way really is just uh, to notice you can't, what you look like to yourself. So if you look down, you'll see your body, but I don't think you'll see your head. Your body fades out above your chest somewhere, at least mine does. I can see a bit my nose, I can even see my glasses, but my nose comes out of where? What is above my chest? And I don't see my own head. And I don't see my own face. And where others see my face, I see nothing, no face, space. Instead of my head, I see the world. And now, uh, to make this really clear, I would invite you to point and direct your attention. And you've got to put aside your shyness just for a moment, or that you might feel a bit silly, and just follow this guidance. And so you take your finger and you point at something in front of you. So I'd like you actually to do this because it directs your attention. And look at what down your finger at what you're pointing at. And all I want you to notice is you're pointing at something. It's got a color and a shape. And now point at your other hand, another thing with a color and shape and even movement. 
Now point back at the place you're looking out of. So you go turn your finger all the way around and point back at where others see your face. And what do you see there? I see nothing. Of course, you see nothing. And that's what I call my true nature, this open space that my finger's pointing at. And then uh, if I point out with the other hand, then we have this gesture of two-way pointing, and this indicates this space at center isn't just empty, it's also full of the whole world. Now, there's uh, just a couple of things to say about this. First of all, it's not a wow experience necessarily. It is just the truth. Uh, you, if you were counting the petals on the flower, you wouldn't say, well, you know, it doesn't make me feel any better. You know, I can see it's got eight petals, but it's the same with this. Just notice what you're looking out of. No one is there but you. The scientists might come all the way up to you and discover almost nothing, you know, quarks or something. But you're at center and you alone can look and see what it's like there. And I say, well, I, I'm going to be my own authority and look for myself. It's very clear and open and spacious and full of everything. But as I say, the first thing is that it, it's uh, not a wow necessarily. It's just what is given. And the second thing is it's nonverbal. So I'm talking about it, but I'm talking from my experience. I have no doubt in my own mind, you've got the same basic experience. You can't see your head. Instead, you see the world. You're looking out of an openness. Uh, but you might think about it differently from me. And that's great, you see. So uh, we are... Uh, giving our attention to the experience and then sharing our reactions to it. So that's an, an initial introduction. It's an experimental way of uh, looking into what you are, because that's important. And uh, I would say directing your attention to this openness. So there's other experiments to do, but that's a, that's a, that's a kickoff, Amir. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and I've said this to you before, because I've been to several of your workshops, and it, what surprises me about it is that it always feels fresh mm. uh, in a way that if you showed me, I imagine even a great, well, maybe a great work of art has the same, the same quality, but most things, you know, once I've seen them 10, 20, 30, 50 times, there's a sense of like, well, I, I know this, I've seen this before, and this has a certain mm. almost, almost surprise, I'm almost surprised faintly surprised yes <laughs> i know i know uh, this is a common response uh that it's as if it's the first time you see this and it's fresh and of course that makes sense i mean things get you know have a beginning and an end and get old and stale and you've seen it before but the nothing here that i'm looking out of isn't a thing there's nothing here to get old it's it's as if it's the first time so and then the other thing is, because sometimes people say, well, so what? Uh, so much of my job, in a way, in terms of sharing the headless way, isn't about sharing the experience, really, in the, in the sense that you can share it very easily. I mean, it takes about five seconds. You look for your face now. Look, don't think about it. Look. And then what do you see? No face, but you see the world. But then you might say, well, so what? And one of the responses I often give to that is says, well, look at someone else now. So, I, you know, I, I might be looking at a mirror and I see your face, but I don't see mine. And it is face to no face. So in terms of articulating that, I say, well, I'm built open for you. I'm empty for you. It's not face to face confronting. Of course, on the screen, I can see, see face, two faces there. So we're head to head there. And someone else, if they were looking at us talking in the room, say they'd see us separate. We understand that. That's what we look like from that range. But on the inside, my experience is face to no face and you're given right here in this open space. Well, that is a different way of relating to so-called others. You see that they are yourself. They were in, within you. This is, this is the basis of love really. So that's a huge so what. And that, you see, the thing about the headless way is that it is an ongoing meditation, if meditation is attention to the way things are. And so uh, this is very practical. You, you, don't, you, you don't have to withdraw and close your eyes and settle down and start with your breath. You can do that. But you can do it. I'm doing it now. And I'm enjoying uh, being space for this conversation, really. Mm. Yes. Very practical. 
And what, what strikes me as so interesting about this approach is the metaphors that you I've heard you use to introduce it. And I, I'm aware that humans can do the same activity and the metaphor that they bring to describe that activity can change the nuance of how they interpret or engage with it. So, you know, you can consider something an exercise or a practice, or it can have a goal, like this is a task and there's a goal, or it can be a game with no particular goal. It's kind of playful and an adventure. Whereas you've mentioned this comes, has something in line with the scientific tradition. And there's this notion of the science of the first person where you, you've called these, because um, I used to think of them as, as kind of games. It kind of made it fun for me, but I've heard you uh, talk about it more as experiments. It's like there's a proposition. Yeah. And then you experiment right. to see if it's true or not. That's right. A hypothesis. Science, you have a hypothesis and you test it. And if something is true in science, it's true for all observers. And uh, th this is the same with this. We have a hypothesis that you are not what you look like, uh, that I am not at center, zero distance, the same as I am from six feet or six miles or six light years. I, I am no thing full of everything as opposed to being a thing separate from others. So there's the hypothesis and let's test it. Now, if it's true, it's true for everyone. And of course it is. Now, what we think and feel about it will differ. What it means to us, how we apply it. Now, that's really interesting. But the basic truth is there for testing. And it's really not even, it's, it's certainly not for taking on trust, even if it's, you know, some great sage has said it, because they're not where you are. You know, all respect to them, but they have no authority to say what it's like at your center. And even you don't have authority to say, well, I saw this a minute ago, so I know it's true. Well, you might be remembering wrong. So the, the thing is to look again. And that is also the hallmark of the headless way. It, it's attention now. And you look again and say, oh, yeah, no, I'm looking out of, you know, a single eye. You can see my two eyes there. But when I, uh, you know, the, the listener or the viewer can bring their hands in front of them, you see, and just hold them apart and then bring them back either side of your head and watch how they disappear into this openness. And I call that a single eye, single openness. And then you bring it forward and your hands come out of this openness, you see. Now that, that's a, there's a little test. Do your hands disappear and do they reappear out of nothingness? Well, you, you do it and you say, you say, you give your results, you know, and uh, I think I need to test that again, you know, I have to have a, uh, I don't know, you know, they test the virus, you know, you, you have to go through the very, I think I need to test that again. Do my hands disappear? Yes, they do. <laughs> am I face to no face? Am I looking at the single eye? When I walk down the street, am I moving or is the street moving through me? Now, this is what Douglas Harding did call the science of the first person. Douglas Harding was the man who pioneered this way. And it's looking at your first person experience as opposed to what you look like to others, which is third person, he or she or something, as an object. What is it like as, a sub as the subject? And this is the science of the subject of the first person. And it is taking seriously what you find. Because normally, if you say, oh, it's subjective, it's dismissive as if it's not real or true or valid. But this is saying, no, wait a minute. My experience of me at zero is as valid as your experience of me from six feet. <laughs> you know? And I'm going to take seriously the results I get, which is I'm built open. I'm space for the world. And I'm going to live from this truth, even though to everybody else, I look like a thing. It makes sense and it's it's visibly true uh, that I am space for the world from my point of view. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I notice in myself, because I, I, I oscillate from it feeling incredibly powerful and profound and then sometimes like a tension of like, oh, but what do other people think about this? This, this habitual uh, reference to the views of other people for validation. And I say, what, well, what do you see here? And they might say, well, I, I see your head. I'm like, oh, then what I see isn't true after all. So there's, there's something about, it feels to me, the, the key in taking this seriously somehow begins with this idea of taking my direct experience very seriously. Yes. Having that be a valid aspect of how I um, operate in the world. 
Yeah, I think so. And you see, it, this is so different, your point of view, from everybody else's view of you, that it would be really surprising if when you saw this, it didn't raise doubts and questions. It's going it's to raise doubts and questions because all your life up to now, you've been basing your, your identity, I've been basing my identity on what other people see. And I've been overlooking what I am and denying it. And, you know, if you're a, a child and you say, mommy, why don't I have a head? She'll go, don't be silly. You know, it, it is, it is uh, dismissed as uh, irrelevant. You're in the wrong, you just can't see it, you know, all of that. So it, it, it's not surprising if this brings up lots of doubts and questions. And so it should, you see. But uh, that was really the work that Douglas Harding did in his books and talks uh, uh, really was about showing how this made sense. And the scientific bit is, of course, relativity, what you are, changes with the range of the observer. So what you are at center is going to be different from what you look like at six feet. So that's, that, that's one way of approaching, making sense of it. The other is the developmental, uh, that, no, that a baby, and you, when you were a baby, you were headless, you were pre-verbal. You have no idea what you look like. From your point of view, you're just open space. You're not face to face with anyone. You haven't got language or you haven't been able to see yourself from outside. You're just subjective. That's your view, headless. And growing up is learning through language to go out and look, turn around and see yourself through the eyes of others. It's empathy, really. And through the eyes of others from over there, of course, you've got a head. Now, as a child, you start to learn that and you look in the mirror and you start to understand that the mirror is telling you what you look like. And you learn to, in effect, reach into the mirror, take hold of that face, pull it out, flip it the other way around, make it big and put it on. We call it playing the face game. And as a child, you're learning to put that face on. You can't actually put it on. You never see anything here. But as a child, you're not quite sure, is it a human face or am I... Uh, a horse or a train today, you know, and it's as easy for it to be a train as a little boy or girl. And that's why it's so playful when you're, you're a child. But what happens is that adults and everyone else around you keeps reflecting back, you're not a train and uh, you're the one in the mirror. And by the time you're an adult, you are now, as it were, outside yourself, seeing yourself as everyone else sees you and denying what you see. And this is the social game. And you've got to play that to be in the game. Uh, so no wonder if we, uh, you know, are, are kind of fixed on that. What I look like, what I look like in the mirror, what I sound like, how I'm going down. Because 24-7, we've been uh, playing that game. And when you see that you're headless, you don't stop playing that game. I'm still aware of my face, my head. I'm Richard. I'm relating to Amir. I'm, you know, here in North London. You're where you are. All of that. But also now I'm appreciating that for myself, I'm space for all of that and space for you. And it's the same space where I am as it is where you are. Now that is, that is... Of course, what all the great mystics say, and it makes sense in terms of science. Now let's uh, now we've got a way of directly experiencing that and not just thinking about it. Here I am. I'm the space. My voice is coming out the space, you know, and, and I'm speaking to the space over there, you know. So in these ways, it opens up a new way of understanding uh, both, you know, what things are through science and how we develop. Really, uh, yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, and I, um, what I, what interests me and what I'm hoping you'll be happy to speak about a little bit today as well is not only is the approach very unique from what I know of, again, spiritual traditions, religious traditions, scientific traditions, but the culture that seems to be evolving around this approach is quite different from typical spiritual traditions or you know the, mm. it's very old this idea and I wonder how you view or if it came to what extent it came out of Douglas's um, personality or the way it just began or the or how if it perhaps evolves out of the technique in, of, in and of itself um, how yeah. I guess the question is humans can a group of humans have the same curiosity of like who am I or what am I or 
um, they can organize themselves in different ways, some very hierarchical, or some based on the faith of someone else, or some, you know, in the headless way community, you could say, is organized in quite a particular way, or these uh, ex experiments are shared in a particular way. Yes. Uh, well, with Douglas Harding, uh, very briefly, he grew up in a very hierarchical Christian, exclusive Plymouth Brethren, they were called, uh, very strict. And uh, he uh, decided to leave when he was 21 because he couldn't accept that they were the only true way to God just because they said they were, basically. He, he, so, uh, and it uh, really, uh, he was cut off from his family because uh, you, if you didn't, toe the line, you were out. And uh, his father was very, very loving towards him, you know, very close relationship, but he said, that's it, you know, and he cut off from him. And Douglas uh, but how, was, however, still interested in who am I and what's the meaning of life when he was, you know, that was 21, when he was 21. And after that, he started to explore what he was in terms of science and philosophy as I've just been talking, because he didn't want to then just go into another group and be told what to think. And the thing about science is that it, it is about experiment, and uh, anybody can do the experiments. And when, when, when you discover uh, that you're headless, you can't discover it only a little bit. You can't half see your no face. You can't see it differently from anyone else. And you can't get better at it, you know, there's nothing. Your understanding develops and your understanding is different from others and how it works out in your life. But the experience, the basic experience it's itself. So this means that basically we're all equal. We all are equally aware of this openness where we are. You and I now, we have different reactions to it, but I, it just doesn't cross my mind that you might be seeing it differently. How could you? And this is very exciting. It, it is a sort of political thing in a way. It's non-hierarchical. Uh, it doesn't uh, mean that you can't have hierarchy. You know, there's lots of hierarchies going on in our lives and you might know something more about, you know, audio recording than I do. So I would defer to you on all of that. But in terms of our true nature, you'd, it's ridiculous to defer to anybody else because you've got it 100%. And this is very exciting uh, because it, uh, I suppose, uh, there are many traditions that are hierarchical and you need the hierarchy to get to God or you need the, you know, you have to wait before the, the truth is delivered. And that's, uh, you're deferring to someone. But uh, w whether or not, uh, you know, whatever I think of that, uh, this is different. Headless way is different. You don't defer. You give them the good straight away. People say, oh, well, how will, you know, people may not value it. Well, how do you know? And if they don't value it, so what? You know, uh, it, it, it's not your right to deny someone access to this because you think they haven't got, you know, not ready or something. So that, that, that it, I'm quite clear on that. And it is a joy to share. And we have many, many, uh, you know, we have, uh, I don't know, 10 Zoom meetings a week now, they're free. Uh, and anyone who is seriously interested in this is welcome to join us. And it's a joy. I mean, just today, there were, I think, three new people and almost every meeting now we have new people and they drop in. One guy, I had corresponded with him a bit, he'd been with the Headless Way for nine years, someone else just, you know, just a day or two. But does anyone think, oh, you're a beginner? No you've got just the same access to this as everyone else. So it is a very different way of kind of hanging out together. There's not like, oh, what does the teacher think? You know, am I, it's like, oh no, everyone's got it, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it continues to fascinate me because um, on the one hand, there's the reference to like, oh, this is what the mystics have said. And then in this case, it's an emphasis on verify it for yourself in your direct experience in this moment. And you don't have to trust your memory either. You can verify it now. Do, do you think, because I'll give you an example, because my, um, my parents were born again Christians for a while. And, um, and that there's a sense there of arriving at a truth that other people haven't seen yet. There's, you know, there's certain parallels 
there's certain parallels and headless way between like scientific investigation. There's certain parallels, as you mentioned, mystics of it being like a, a spiritual path or s some kind of liberation being found. And uh, with with my parents, they got very excited, as many people do. They started a fellowship. You know, they they also were not interested in hierarchy. They started a fellowship among friends, and they'd meet on Sundays and they'd read and they'd discuss. And <laughs> and it didn't take very long. Um, you know, a, a few months or within a couple of years before someone came along from a, another church and uh, kind of integrated into the community and then started saying, oh, well, we've got to look after those that are lost and the sheep and we, we need a kind of, I don't know what term he used, like a priesthood and um, kind of mm. before too long, my parents had been kicked out of the <laughs> little fellowship that they had, they'd started because they refused to sign an obedience form, um, you know, of allegiance to the person, the self-appointed priesthood in this like little thing. But a lot of it was, in some ways, is similar. You know, a born again Christian might feel like, well, you just accept Jesus, and that's it. You you kind of see it, and people have these experiences. But so so again, just kind of coming back at this question from another angle. Do you feel like the headless way community has resisted that out of the force of the personalities in it? Of like, well, we don't want to do that old tide route, or is it just the the strength of what is being looked at resists that organically, like it. It doesn't take a lot of effort to resist people that come in and want to set, set up a kind of hierarchy. It's just, well, look, how are you going to know more than me? Just point back. I've got it as much as you do. Well, I think that uh, human beings can corrupt anything. Oh. <laughs> you know? So I wouldn't put it past someone to corrupt the headless way in a way, you know, uh, let, let, you know somewhere down the line. Who knows? Uh, one, isn't one isn't claiming any kind of perfection in terms of how one lives it, you know. Uh, but you can't, uh, the, the source itself can't be corrupted. And this is direct access to that. Now, I think it did make a big difference that Douglas Harding had left this hierarchical religion, which started like the one that your parents were, and it, it, it got corrupted. And I've heard of that many times. You can, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious, really. And Douglas Harding, however, you see, he came he didn't go come at it from a religious really point of view. He came at it from a scientific philosophical thing. And he used to say, just seeing who you are, it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's not just an, an idea whose time has come, it's an experience whose time has come. And it's a bit like evolution or relativity. I mean, you don't join a club and preach relative, you know, it, it's just true. It's just true. And it's the same with this. But Douglas, he was, because he really thought it through clearly and worked it out, you know, for himself, he was very clear that you can't get any better at this or worse at this, and it's just true, and it's nothing to do with organized religion, and that's the problem, usually, is organizing it. And he, so he, uh, he put that out, that, that message, alongside that, you know, it just goes with the message as far as he was putting it out. You can't do it wrong. No one can tell you who you are, but you, you're the only one where you are. You're the only one with the authority to see it, you, you, all of that. And uh, he didn't uh, use it to promote himself, quite the opposite in a way. Uh, he said, no, Douglas is as, as much as forward as anybody, but I'm not Douglas, you see. Are you? What are you? Are you a thing? And I took that on board and have kept the flame burning in the sense in our groups. I, I'm very, uh, you know, keen to keep that culture going, to keep reminding everyone that they're the authority, they've got it, you can't do it wrong. Of course, people love it, but we do need to sort of learn it in a way. We or because the opposite is usually what is being foisted on us and someone will come along. And if someone does come into the group and starts telling people what they should do, I, you know, I, I have to say, look, you know, that might be right for you, but it's not for me. And, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, of course, pe once people get the, recognize what it is in that sense they love it and they will you know they they will defend it really yeah i can see um i can see the beginnings of i don't want to call it corruption but i so because i mentioned to you before how i'm aware of certain i think buddhist traditions and certain traditions where they seem to refer to similar observations 
um, but they're often kept secret until someone is deemed ready. It's like when someone is, um, you know, they've, they've had the right prerequisite realizations or they're at a certain stage in the development or what have you. And that always seemed very confusing to me until um, I was with my partner and we asked this guru had just told us like a secret and we'd been sworn to secrecy or whatever. And it was like, I kind of heard this elsewhere in that Kedless Way gatherings and <laughs> I kind of already know this one, but okay, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep your wording of it a secret. Um, but she was like, well, why? why is it a secret? You know, genuinely asking very genuinely, why is it a secret? This is very valuable, interesting information. And he said, um, because if people aren't ready for it, then they won't value it. And then they might not come back for it when they're ready. And it's, and it struck me as, oh, I, I understand that point of view. It reminded me of, you know, not that I'm Christian or, or anything, but there's that phrase that made famous by Jesus, I guess, uh, you don't throw, what is it? pearls to swine or something oh yes and um i know this is a long introduction to this question but as you know i've been sharing uh these experiments in in different courses and workshops i do and i tend to save it for week three i also have that feeling of like oh if i get people relaxed enough they'll the profundity of this is more likely to land with them and i'm always aware there's some people who just that yeah they have the so what reaction and i feel like oh, if i can prepare the ground in the right way they'll be less so what and more like oh wow this is amazing and of course, if I kept going that route, then it might be like, well, people need three years preparation before I tell them, or maybe they need five years or whatever. I, and again, so I'm curious that hasn't, that obviously hasn't developed in a headless way. It's like on the cover of the book. It's, you know, yes. you come up the well, stairs at psychedelic side and say, oh, you can't see your own face, can you? Like, that's it. That's always given the secret away. No, no hesitation. Well, uh, in terms of my own approach, I... I uh, I took to heart what Douglas Harding said to me once. He said, Richard, don't rely on this for your income. And it doesn't mean to say you can't charge, but mm -hmm. if you rely on it, then you need people to come back and you're dependent on them coming back and paying you. So mm -hmm. it, it is a, to your advantage if you don't give it away, because then mm -hmm. they'll, you know, but if you give it all straight up, you, you might get worried that, oh, well, I've just given the whole thing away. Maybe they won't come back. Mm. So from that point of view, it was a very wise thing for Douglas to say. So I haven't relied on it for my income. So it, it uh, I, and then after when that frees you, that frees you, you see. And uh, I used to put, try and, you know, I give an introduction and all of that. Douglas used to give long introductions. It got longer the older he got, really. Mm. And I eventually found my own way, which is, and I'll probably change, which is to give it just straight, go straight to the experience. It's really respectful of everyone. You say, you know, you're the authority uh, and, um, and here you are, you know, now, now you've got it. And it is also very interesting. You know, it's a different way of going about it. And I think my true nature likes to experiment and have an adventure, you know, and just let's throw the pearls to swine. And let's, you know, because they might turn into princes and princesses, all of them, you know, immediately, who knows, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I have, uh, you know, I, uh, I do have investment in what people, how people react, but on another level, I don't, it's nothing to do with me. And it's rather interesting to see how it comes back. So uh, this is a different way. And uh, I, I don't know how you can tell if someone's ready People say, so can you tell if someone's going to value this or not? And I have to say, no, I can't. I, I used to think I could, could but I, there are enough times where you think someone's going to love it and they go, mm, oh, that's stupid, you know. <laughs> and then someone you think, God, I just, you know. I'll tell you a very funny story. Uh, I was in Iceland and I was invited to give a workshop there and it, it was really badly organized went with my partner and, and we turned up and at the workshop, it was a two day workshop In it was lovely there. I mean, it was summer, so it was light, you know, at night. Anyway, we did this workshop in the Theosophical Society and there was me, Mirka, my partner, the guy who organized it and the guy who opened the door, right? <laughs> and we decided not to do it in the main hall of the church. We went up to the library, you see, mm. and uh, we sat there, four of us, and 
I knew the guy who'd organized it, Leo, and of course my partner and me. The other guy, Halson or Halwell, Halwell or somebody, an elderly gentleman, very cultured, who knew all about Krishnamurti, and was sitting there, uh, and he wanted to do the workshop. He don't, you know, he, he was interested. He'd been the chairman of the Theosophical Society. Now he was just, you know, he was retired p concert pianist, you know. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we've got two days, and I'm thinking, all right, I'll give an introduction. I give an introduction. And then after a while, and I'm, I'm thinking, Richard, you've just got to, you can't delay any longer, you know, doing the pointing experiment. And there's this cultured guy. And I'm thinking he's going to think this is really stupid, you know. But I thought, that, you know, eventually, after I'd done my spiel, I, there was no other way of doing it. And I rather cringingly, you know, embarrassedly got as four of us to point, you know, and point. I mean, how stupid is that? Point back and what do you see in about there? There was a pause and I waited for it. I waited <laughs> for him, him, him to go, you know, like. And he looked up and he said, that is pure genius. Huh. It, it, it was shocking and beautiful. And we had a lovely couple of days and, uh, together. You know, uh, it, it, it was uh, the last kind of response I thought I'd get from him. And wow. it, it, yeah, so you can never tell. So someone who says, you know, they need preparation, I, mm -hmm. I think, well, they might do in your tradition. Uh, but I hear of some people who sit and meditate for decades and don't feel their home. And I think, what, what is going on there? That is really inefficient. <laughs> you know, oh, oh. And you're building up your, your idea of what it's gonna be, you know, when I'm, actually it's just being yourself. Yeah. Hmm. And so do, do you perceive this seeing as synonymous with what other traditions call enlightenment or awakening or coming home? Well, if it's not, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't comment really, you know, because I'm not an authority on those things. So, you know, that you just walk into an argument about what enlightenment is, but I can say what I am. And, uh, and that this is, as far as I'm concerned, the heart of the heart of the heart of the matter. Uh, 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 and if it's not for your tradition, tell me what is, I'd be interested to know. Um, Douglas used to say, well, Jesus said, if your eye is single, then your whole body is full of light with no place dark, you see. And he said, well, obviously he's talking about a single eye and, and you're full of light with no place dark. And then he'd say, and if he didn't mean this, he should have. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, you know, but, but, you know, when you're home and dry, you, you, you don't have to fight all those other battles, you know. That, that, uh, and I, I think we've got something so good going, uh, it will speak for itself, really. You know, it does speak for itself. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and when you say Herbert Dreyck, so, um, so there's the, the first person science uh, aspect, which I absolutely love. And it just seems undeniable. I've not yet, I share it with the occasional people. And like when I first discovered it, shared it with maybe with people that were very interested. Um, but I didn't find anyone that would deny that they can't see their own face. Yeah. And I was sometimes surprised. I, I introduced to an active friend who thinks a lot of what I'm interested in is kind of strange, is a bit curious that I uh, keep going on about it. Um, but when I mentioned this to him, he said, oh yeah, I'm obsessed with that. I mean, he, had, he had seen it himself and like I'm obsessed with it I can't see my own face but he was slightly troubled by it because he's an actor and he wanted to yeah. look that all the time so that he had a slightly different angle but he'd, he had kind of seen that for himself so there's this there's the noticing which was quite shocking at least for me initially of oh wow I've never seen my own face where others see it and I I never will I can't even imagine that and then there's the side of it that is, is yeah there's the coming home aspect or there's this kind of a liberation or relief or something else that can happen in the seeing of it. Yes, I, I, I think you see that it's not surprising when your actor friend says that because I, I think it's it's not uncommon really because it 
it makes sense it's not uncommon because it is your own experience. You've never, ever mm -hmm. seen your face. Uh, you've always been looking out of this single openness. Uh, and uh, so it is very familiar. Um, I think the thing is that you've got to live from it. And then it will speak to you and, and benefit you. If you just notice it and dismiss it as kind of weird or odd, and then don't actually practice it, if I can put it like that, be enjoy it, be aware of it, live from it, then it, it, it doesn't grow in you at the level of understanding and surrender and uh, all of that. You've got, you've got to live it. and uh, But living it isn't so difficult as it sometimes advertised to be. You know, it, it, you can get into the habit of it, face to no face, single eye, being still. Close your eyes, you've no boundaries, you know. Uh, and it grows. It's natural. It's, it's, it, it's just uh, natural. So, But you do have to live it. And hanging out with others, you see, is really uh, a, a infectious. When you are a baby, you're headless. You're, you're just your own point of view. And uh, that is infectious. If you're with a baby, the baby sort of, you know, you don't, you don't feel that the baby's looking at you and throwing your face back and judging you. It's just open. So you, you're open. It's infectious. Now, what happens is the baby, the infant, you, when you were that age, were in a, a group of people, your family, who were all reflecting back and talking about and acting as if you're behind a face. So you have no option but to act as if you're behind a face. If you want your food and you want to belong and you want to join in in the adventure of life, you see. And so that, that is going on 24-7. So uh, you, you can't resist it, but you don't want to resist it. So, and you're giving it back as much as you're getting because you're saying, I'm, you know, I'm Richard and you're Amir, and, you know, to the child, other children and, and the teenagers, you're in that milieu. And the idea of being headless is just not on the agenda and no one's talking about it and no one wants, wants to. So you can see how it is uh, infectious through society. Now, uh, when you uh, then see this and value it and say, oh, my point of view is as valid, my point of view of me is as valid as your view of me, and they're very different, but they fit together well. If you are with others uh, who are aware of that as well as being aware of what they look like, it's infectious. I mean, like now we're talking about it. We're, we're not having to prove it and debate about it and establish which bits, are, you know, we just relax into it. Two faces on the screen, one consciousness, two voices in one consciousness. This is totally natural and sort of infectious. And the more that we're with others uh, talking about it or even just being together quietly, of course, you know, because it's in the air, the more it, you, the more it just becomes a kind of, you can't deny it, you know, you're living from it. Uh, so we've got everything on our side. It, this isn't some kind of state that you've got to somehow withdraw from the world in order to cultivate. And uh, it's something special you've got that, that says, uh, you know, no, this is totally natural next stage of development. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, speak, yeah, speaking of stages, I was also struck, again, the difference between what I notice in the headless uh, community or the approach of the books uh, and the exposure that I've had to it versus, say, some of the, um, let's say, Buddhist traditions, and, and some of them are, I mean, there's different ones. There's obviously the, the Zen traditions, which it sounded like Douglas Harding had a lot of uh, affinity with, um, but then there are, say, some Theravada or Tibetan traditions that have very elaborate uh, maps and stages of which realization you have when and um, and on the one hand the, the headless way books are kind of full of maps and diagrams and the stages and there's the child and this and that but once there's the seeing there's kind of well there's living from it but there's no like I mean the, the experiments are, are laid out in a certain order oftentimes you often point out and then and then and then back out there's a kind of logic to that um, but there I don't get the sense of so as an example, uh, one lecture I heard recently, it's like, well, ideally first you, you notice awareness is free of thought, and then you can notice it's free of the self, there's no fixed or permanent self, and then you can see it's timeless and boundless. And it's kind of, they've got it mapped out as a, in an order that you should, or that most people realize things in, whereas 
there doesn't seem to be an inclination to want to do that in this community or in your in your approach. No. Uh, well, one thing about the different traditions and headlessness that Douglas broke away from the Christian tradition, uh, but it was always very important to him. And it's a map, isn't it? And it, it's, there are words of power if you're brought up with those in that tradition. It, it has a power to you that is beyond just sort of an intellectual thing. It's a gut thing. And that always was there for Douglas. But when he uh, explored and discovered who he was, he put it in scientific terms. And that was free of that, free of that. It was not dependent on that structure, whether whatever religion. Now, uh, 20 years after he saw this, he came across Zen uh, when it was just coming into the West. And to begin with, he did think that headlessness was, was Zen. And it, 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 in many ways, it, it was a marvelous thing for him to discover Zen because people were talking about it, you know, your original face in his language. So he felt he'd made friends. He could see that the mystics were talking about this. But what struck him about Zen was the, the much more talking about the direct ex visual, ex physical experience of it rather than the kind of spiritual ideas. But after a while, he, he realized, no, actually, headlessness isn't Zen. Zen is Zen and headlessness is, is its own. It stands on its own. It doesn't need uh, to be under the umbrella of Zen in order to be valid. It, 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 this is appealing to your, this is new. This is something new. But of course, uh, Douglas wrote, he taught comparative religion and he wrote religion to the world. He related this experience, not just to Zen, but to the other religions. In, in it, it gives you a way into understanding the heart of religion when you've got the basic experience. And uh, so, uh, yeah. I don't know, I've forgotten your question now. <laughs> yeah, it was related to the, the capacity between that and Zen and also the a sense of like, um, so let's say uh, one tradition might emphasize this idea of awareness. Oh yeah, all right. Might notice, uh, and in a sense I've seen your workshops, sometimes, I mean, you tend to talk about the timelessness of this space after at some point talking about the, the emptiness or voidness of it. So, but there isn't like a specific kind of map and like, I can't teach you the timelessness until you've noticed the. No, but you, uh, you see, with the headless way, I think you go, as you go on with it, you free yourself to trust it. And it's fun just maybe one time to start with the timelessness. There is no logical uh, progression. You're at the center and you're looking out and, uh, and every way out is equal. And uh, what is also fun is, I mean, sometimes in a Zoom meeting, you'll have someone come in. And you've met, never met them before, but you you know you have a you can see ah oh, okay that they're you know they're enjoying this and they 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 they've got a few words about it and you say okay uh, can you lead us through an experiment and you've never met them before and everyone goes ooh what, what's going to happen here it's fun you see and you and and they come out with a way of directing your attention to it that you've never thought of or is a new angle on it. And then you give yourself that permission yourself. So well, I'm not going to turn up and go, how boring to go A, B, C, D, E again. You turn up and you say, well, what is happening in this situation now? Let's see what comes out. Now that is alive. And I, I, I think, you know, one of the way that ways get corrupted is that way, you know, it ossifies into a structure and then everyone follows the structure and then it's dead really. Uh, uh, yeah, one has got to keep kind of letting go of how you did it yesterday and, and seeing what comes out today. And then it's alive. And, you know, it's the nature of the void is to be creative. And, you know, the voice is coming out of nowhere now. You, you've, it's never said this before in this way, you know, it's never mm -hmm. had this conversation before. It, it, yeah, yeah. And do you uh, let me just look at my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas say in paragraph B, chapter nine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. A, it is amazing, amazingly freeing. Um, and what? Because I don't. I know you worked for many years as a therapist, and I and I have asked you this before. And you said, and I asked, to what extent do you bring this into your work with clients? And and you said, not not really. It's a different. 
Um, well, with uh, that specific situation, people have not come for headlessness. They've come for bereavement or whatever it is. They've got a reason for coming. And it would be disrespectful and bullying to, it would be a bit, you know, be, be introducing something that they're not interested in. And, and there's, you've no right to put your thing onto them. You as a therapist, uh, you're the, but that applies to relationships anyway, doesn't it? Respect. So uh, I did not introduce headlessness and, unless on a very few occasions when someone really asked about it, mm -hmm. then I, I, of course, but, but normally no. But what I do, what you do is you be headless. You be space for the client. You know, that now this means that you're being attentive and respectful uh, uh, in a non-intrusive way. And it also means that you accept that that person is this open space where they are as well as you, which means that they're, you know, even though they may not know it, everyone is living from it. So it enables you in a way to put yourself in their shoes. And it means that because you're living from the, this, the truth yourself and you're learning to, to just to trust it in a way that it comes up with what you need then you're with the other person and you're inviting them you know well what do you think I mean I can't tell you what I think but you're not you know the authority on them you can help them but uh, you're in you know so it's, a, it's you're still living from this and that is a very significant thing when you're with someone else face to no face even if you uh, say nothing and I don't go around you know in the shop saying I'll have uh, you know a pound of butter please but have you noticed you can't see your face, your face. <laughs> 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 I'm aware of it, you know, and uh, that 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 changes your relationship with everyone. It it must do. Uh, and so, when you say living from there, am I right in thinking that means to be aware of it? There's no yeah. specific kind of manual of like this. It's how you yeah. tie your shoes from there. It's like I'm aware of this as I tie my shoes. I'm aware of this as I ask for the butter. Yes, that's right. And I think you see. Uh, uh, there was someone who came to a meeting recently and he'd been aware of the headless wave for some years and eventually he came to a, a meeting and at the end of the meeting he said something like I wish I'd come to these before because you see how others are living it uh, and you it's very helpful and inspiring uh, and everyone sort of reacts differently so you don't get stuck in this idea well living from it means this you know, uh, what does living from it mean? Well, uh, you know, you could put it in words, it's face to no face or single eye, but that is beginning to ossify it almost, you know. But those are very useful, you know, to communicate to yourself and to others, you know, be, uh, being this, you know, you know being this space. It, it, and it's tremendously uh, helpful in all kinds of situations. Uh, uh, yeah yeah i'm noticing my um i'm really enjoying this conversation and i also noticed like a part of me that i think if i reflect on it is maybe vigilant because of this younger experience when i was just a child and um we were we were kicked out of this fellowship and i didn't really understand i just i remember a group of other children telling me oh you're not meant to be here anymore <laughs> <laughs> and um and then you know my parents went off to another religion and and similar things happen there for different reasons they kind of went from one group to the next and and some I, I noticed part of me is like well how is this corruptible and <laughs> and my personal experience when I look at my own personal experience it's, it's void it's empty it's capacity for the world it's undeniably true it's very it's very obvious as soon you know I forget all the time and then when it gets pointed out I remember and it's obvious again um and then but obviously uh I don't know if you had a client of this nature but one can believe with utter conviction that they're Napoleon or they're the next messiah and you know they can live live from that truth where is that where is that line of like well this is my direct experience there's this capacity for the world and I'm going to be aware of that and, and then something beautiful happens and 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 not it be I am the second coming and I'm going to live from there and <laughs> it'll probably be a bit of a pain in your ass for everyone I, well now you mentioned that I was <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you see, the essence of, of the Headless Way is you're the authority, not anyone else, and not even your memory. 
And uh, it's radical. You have to look again. And you can't prove it. You can't prove it even to yourself in a way, but you certainly can't prove it to anyone else. Anyone who looks here sees my head. They don't see my headlessness. Only I can see it. And uh, uh, I think as far as the way that I try and express it, uh, you, you can never fi finally say what it is. Uh, it's always limited. And, and you've always got to be sort of letting go of the way you thought about it or the way you felt about it and coming back to the simple experience, the simple truth. So I think the, the concern that it can be corrupted is a very healthy one. Uh, but the only remedy is to have another look. <laughs> you know? mm. Mm. And do you have, uh, you know, I've, I've had a, a couple of experiences of this, of sharing it with someone and they, their immediate reaction was quite strong and not obviously positive. Now, very often later it, it was, uh, but it's, and again, I'm aware maybe some people, they've probably stopped listening by now, but I know some people listening might still be in the kind of so what territory that their curiosity keeps them listening to this kind of thing. Um, and I'm aware that's always a bit weird. I imagine it's a bit weird to hear that someone else has had like a very strong experience on pointing back at nothing and, and for someone else it's so what. But yeah, I've seen people um, kind of feel fear that they're disappearing or burst into tears or, you know, I'm sure you've seen it all over the years or, you know, someone said, <laughs> uh, he got over it, so I'm laughing now, it's okay, but he kind of was pointing back himself, I was like, I have a feeling that my life's work is meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that wasn't the intention. Um, That's the strap line on our headlight, <laughs> on our headless way website, makes your life meaningless immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you so, see, you can I, laugh about it now too, but in the yeah. moment I was like, oh, uh, you know, there's something positive here to be seen as well. I'm mean, just curious if you have a, despite having said there's no kind of go-to thing that you always do and it's always fresh and new, if there's certain things that you've noticed and how you respond when someone has a strong reaction that doesn't feel positive in that moment. Well, uh, I, I don't think I can say how I will, you know, but, you know, you, you, the essence of it, you're attentive and you respond in the moment and you trust that. Uh, and, you, you know, my style is to to take in what the person is saying and respect it and, uh, and not tell them that they're wrong or they're doing it wrong. You know, their reaction is totally valid from their point of view. Uh, so I, I think uh, I, I take probably the, hopefully the approach of respecting and listening and attending and understand, understanding as, as much as I can. Um, if someone gets sort of resistant, then I probably back off. There's absolutely no point in resisting their resistance or trying to persuade them otherwise. I, I, I try and just relax and, and be with, you know, and talk about something else if they want to. It, it's no, you know, I don't feel the need to kind of bang on about it or convince them. But, you know, I, I also think that it's, it's not surprising if someone cries or laughs or gets high, you know, because it isn't you know, from one point of view, it's the most important thing that you can ever discover. And so that, you know, but that will change, that will change. And I, I've been around enough to know that the person who, uh, who goes, wow, you know, it's quite likely the next day they'll go, oh yeah, no, that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. But the person who goes, oh, oh no, that's really, that's, that's, yeah, no, that's true. They might stay with it, but you never know. And, when you kind of hang out with it long enough, you know, pe people come and go and people hang around and then they go again and they come back. And uh, that that's just, you. that's fine. That's fine, you know, and uh, it's interesting. And uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, if someone gets really frightened of it, you, you once, one can understand that. You look, it feels like you've disappeared, you know, that, how can I function? There's nothing. Mm. But uh, the, the, the fact is that you've been functioning as nothing all the time anyway, mm. for a start. There's nothing new. True, yeah. yeah, and it does work. But um, this is where it's for exploring and uh, testing out. Yeah. I met someone who compared it to how disorientating it, it must have been when everyone believed the 
uh, the earth was flat or the, you know, the earth was rotating around the, uh, no, sorry, the sun was rotating around the earth and then yeah. you know, we've actually got conclusive. Oh, yeah. yeah, it must have felt quite strange and that's not even, well, you've been functioning, it's always been true, you've always been functioning, you're not going to be able to, you can still go down to the shops and buy the butter. Yes, and the thing is that uh, I think some people, uh, myself included, you can see it and then you stop seeing it and just think about it. And uh, then you, you, you know, you might think, oh, that's stupid or that's frightening. But the point, the, the, the remedy is to come back to seeing it uh, as well as thinking about it. Uh, and that's true now. I, I notice again, I'm looking out of this open space, you know, and here we are again, just being aware of what, what, what we are. Uh, so, uh, yeah, seeing it rather than just thinking about it is important, I suppose. Yeah. And this is like just a curiosity, but w with, you know, you started uh, being involved in this some few decades ago now, right? 50 years ago, this year. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious, after 50 years of being involved in the seeing, has it influenced your, and now we go into areas that we can't necessarily prove or, or have any certainty around, but if you've speculated on metaphysical questions of like, well, what is the, the essence of reality? You know, some people say it's all consciousness or some people have a different idea or, you know, what happens after death? Is there some kind of continuation to this idea called Richard or not? Has this headless uh, approach influenced those ideas or? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Your mind altogether? Yeah, no. It, uh, it... It is a journey of discovery, and you have to, in the end, work things out for yourself. I did, anyway. Uh, and it, it is a new way, in a way, it's a new way of thinking about the world, as well as seeing the world. It influences, you know, like relativity changes the way people think, in a way. You know, and evolution, the idea of you know, evolution, that changed the way people think. Well, this is the same. Uh, it changes the way you think and about the way you, you think about your development, the way you think about life and death uh, and all of those things. And it keeps changing it. And, uh, uh, you know, and for example, that, you know, do you, you, you don't, you, you, I think your, my appreciation that the source itself is completely inscrutable. That, you know, you can't know it like you know a thing. You, you know, you talk about it till the cows come home. But it, in itself, it is just such an inscrutable mystery. And yet you are it. it. There's the paradox. Now that gets more and more, you know, astonishing and wonderful, really. And there's a beautiful little poem by Angelus Silesius from the 17th century Silesia or somewhere. God bends and bows and to himself doth pray. Well, you know, you call this what you like, but he called it God. But, you know, it, it, it is yourself, and yet it's totally other. It's totally not yourself. I mean, what do you know about it? Yet you are it. So God bends and bows to himself, and to himself doth praise. Wow, you are amazing. <laughs> and he's talking to himself. And this is the wonderful thing about sharing it, you see, because you can talk to someone else who is also the one. There's the one talking to itself now in this conversation. The one is talking to itself and going, wow, you know, I don't, I don't know how I'm doing this. <laughs> you know, I'm winging it. <laughs> and so we spoke a little bit about how um, the headless community culture, the, cult, the, you know, the community of people interested in this have, have organized themselves or, or they're organized in a fairly non-hierarchical way. Uh, and, and then you mentioned how new ideas or new observations can change how we think. So, you know, evolution changed how certain things were organized and relativity is kind of filtering its way into society and how we organize things. Do you have any guesses about if headlessness kind of percolates through society and culture a bit more wildly, um, widely, it's likely to have a similar effect? And oh yeah, well, it's already doing so. And the way that those ideas have effect is uh, on one level is they affect the language. I mean, the very word relativity or evolution gets into the language and changes the way of talking, communicating about things. Well, in, in terms of the headless way, you've got new phrases like face to no face. Now, the single eye being still in the, the world moves through you, but take the one face to no face. 
really, uh, we tend to only see what language lets us see. So up till now, we've had just face to face. So we've acted as if we're face to face. But now we've got the phrase face to no face, it's in the language. That sort of gives us permission to be face to no face. Now, there is already, you can see how that's changing the way we talk, the way we think, you see? Or that, you know, this, the, the whole premise of this conversation is that you're looking out of space and I'm looking out of space and there's no difference and it's one consciousness, you know? So we, 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 this, this is a different way of being together, two voices in one consciousness. You know, this, you know, this is, this is uh, already, it's evolving and affecting the way that we think and react to each other, and uh, we're only at the beginning of it. I, I, can't, I can't, not consistently, but occasionally notice, uh, often in your workshops, but sometimes outside as well, uh, noticing, keeping my awareness at some level on this aspect of face to no face, and the emptiness here and the fullness there, that something arises that, I don't know if this is the best word, but I'll use it anyway, love. And mm. It feels like a, a love arising. Yes, yeah. in that space for what's for what's in the space. Yes, I, I was very touched when Catherine Harding mentioned um, uh, who just for anyone who doesn't know, she, were they married? She was the, yes. the partner of Douglas. Yes, uh, second wife of Douglas. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So they were partnered for many years, and and she, and she died. She was in her nineties, I guess. She died last year. Or this September, year. just a couple of months ago. Yeah. So I think it was the year before that I heard her talking and she said, you know, after some years, this emptiness kind of, I can't remember her exact words, but something like it sunk down into her heart and what I found there was a unending pool or reservoir of love. <laughs> it's like very poetic and very, very moving. And yeah, I, said, so, wow, uh, I want some of that. <laughs> yes, you lo lose your head and find your heart is another way of putting it. The, the caveat, the, the thing to say is that then don't go looking for a, a pool of love, a reservoir of love as a kind of thing, because then you're on a wild goose chase. It, 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 it's, it's a lovely image, image and it, it is important to use these images, but it points to a place that isn't a thing. And that's what you keep coming back to. What, what one of the traps in all these kinds of things is, is you have a wow experience of love or peace or something like that. And then it goes, and then you think you've lost it and you chase it. Well, in as much as it's a thing, it, it will go. Even the deepest experience of love or something will go. But the source of that, it, the, the, the knack, the art is to keep returning to that source which isn't a thing and then wait for the next thing to come rather than try and uh, recreate something so uh, and it will come it will come but it won't be what you thought it was going to be hmm. the uh, the other aspect of this i'm fascinated by again is how uh, every my whole life when i had looked down at my body there was no head at the top of it but someone else had to point it out to me i know it's <laughs> It's embarrassing. <laughs> and then when they did it, it was it was surprising. It continues to be surprising sometimes. It's like, oh, there is, there's still no. <laughs> so I need to get a refund. There's, there's no head at the top of this body, and um, and I'm just curious, you, you know, as the science of the first person develops or continues, that I'm curious or excited to think, well, there might be something else that's kind of just always been true, staring me right in my face, in my experience, and someone else will one day notice and say, hey, I've noticed this, not only do you not have a head, but, but you know, I haven't, hasn't been discovered oh, yeah. perhaps. Oh yeah, well, I, I, your true nature, uh, you, uh, I would say you can't go any further than that. You know, it's not an appearance of something else that is currently hidden. It's not an appearance. This is the bottom line. So in that sense, I would say I'm quite sure in that sense that I'm home. But the, the, uh, the discoveries that one makes, uh, there are endless discoveries to make that we haven't a clue about, I, I imagine, because this place is so you know, vast and deep, endlessly creative. Now, one of the things, for example, uh, is that when you look at uh, yourself in the mirror or you look at others, you see that there's head, chest, feet, you know, legs, feet. 
But when you look at yourself, and you probably have to draw this to, to see it, you're upside down. Your, your chest is at the bottom of the field of vision and your legs are about halfway up and you're upside down. Now, uh, that is, I, 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 it's only recently I've really taken that to heart. I really, I, I'm not at all like the one in the mirror. I'm upside down and my body stuck down at the bottom into the nothing, you know. And these things, I think, uh, will, will come to us in different ways and there'll be quite new discoveries to make about the world. I, I think we've only just, uh, you know, touched the top, you know, the tip of the iceberg, really. And, and this is, uh, Douglas said to me, he said, you know, there are much deeper fish in the sea of being than we've ever seen yet. You know, much bigger fish in the sea of being than we, you know. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure that's true. And this is the life you see, living from this is a life of creativity and adventure and discovery. And it really is. It's not like you're ticking off the boxes, you know, what is next in the spiritual journey. It is a, a, a journey unfold, unfolding and genuinely new things coming out every day, you know. It is, uh, it, you're sitting at the oracle, listening to the oracle speak, you know? <laughs> and most of the time you don't understand what it's saying. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's exciting to me, this idea of a culture where you can turn up at a meeting where this is being discussed, and it, and it might be your first time and you'll notice something true that everyone confirms is true and that no one had noticed yet. That, oh, that happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And it may not be... Uh, uh, you know, your body's upside down. It might be just the tone of voice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was someone a couple of days ago who came into the meeting, a young guy in Japan, and I'd never met him before. His mother had been to a workshop in Tokyo, and she said, look, you're, I think you ought to look at the website. He looked at it, got it, came into the meeting, and I think enthralled everybody to have this person just turn up. And his way of putting it was his own, and no one else quite said it in that way. It was quite poetic, really. And uh, we were all inspired, you know, and he was inspired, you know, because he, here he was able to communicate his experience to a whole group of people who were saying, got it, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Never heard it like that before, well. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, 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 it's wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> So I wonder if it's worth ending with um, pointing out a couple more things. Yes, we could do that. Yes, bring people's attention back, including ours, to the, yes. Well, uh, uh, w one of them that is, uh, we, we could just do a little bit with eyes open and a bit with eyes closed, just to show that it, it works with eyes closed. But the single eye is a wonderful thing. Mm. And uh, if you can see us on video, that's great. If not, you can still do it. You hold your hands out like binoculars, put your fingers together, two round holes, or take your glasses off if you want. And you see two holes there. And now you bring them on like putting on glasses and you see the dividing line disappears and it's just one hole. See, oh, and then you bring your hands back and it disappears. So this is the single eye, just one opening here. Now, uh, when you look at this, uh, so there's the view out, the colors and shapes, the room or wherever, and the view in is no thing, but there's no dividing line. So just notice a few things about the view out, bring your attention to, is that uh, anything you look at, like my face on the screen or any object in front of you has got a boundary with things all the way around it. It's within a context, anything, you look at is uh, a thing within a group of other things. Now look at the whole view out. You see how it fades out all the way around. Is there anything around it? Well, no, it, uh, it just fades out. There's nothing above it, nothing below it. So it's not inside anything. Now, when you look at an object within the view, you could say, well, that's bigger than that or smaller than that, it's relative. One thing is bigger or smaller than another. Now look at the whole view and ask yourself, how big is it? Well, there isn't a second view on the right to compare it with. So you can't say how big it is. I can't. How wide is it, you see? Well, it's as wide as east is from west. You know, it's just wide. 
very wide. <laughs> very wide. <laughs> so uh, the other thing is you can measure a distance between two things, between the lamp and the cup, you know, or between the cup and the pen. Now look at the whole view. How far away is it? Well, from where? There's nowhere to measure from, you see. It's just here. So that is starting to pay attention to the way things are actually given that we're not cognizant of, we're not aware of normally. You know, who talks about the single? It's single, the single view. It's not actually inside your head or inside anything. It's just hanging in consciousness. And you can't say how big it is, you know, because there is it's nothing to compare it with. And, it, and where is it? It's not. It's not going to address. It's hanging in the middle of consciousness. Now, if you close your eyes, I think you'll find it, that it's still true. You've got a darkness. So I ask you, how big is the darkness? Well, there's not a second one to compare it with. It's single. Now, where is it? Is it, is it got something all the way around it? You know, inside a, a bigger context that you say, oh, well, there it's there. No, it's just hanging in nothing. And, and how far away is it? Well, from where? Now, it's always been like this, but now you're just aware the darkness is, is just single, floating in nothing. And uh, you become aware of sounds, the different sounds going on. Well, how big is the whole field of sound? Well, there isn't a second. You see, and now you start to explore and listen and pay attention, and you're open to the way it's given rather than what you've been told. Are the sounds happening inside your head or inside anything? Or are they coming and going in this one silence, in this nothingness that the darkness is in? Well, I say they're coming out of nowhere. And they don't disturb the silence. They don't leave a mark on it. It's just, and uh, body sensations the same. You'd be aware of the whole field of sensation. You drop memory of the image of your body. Now, how big is that whole field of sensation? Well, there isn't a second to compare it with. And is it inside something? No. So you say, well, are you inside something? Well, no, I don't find anything around this sensation, field of sensation, which I identify with that. And the same with thoughts and feelings. You know, you're aware of your commentary. Well, how big is that whole field of mind? Well, there isn't a second to compare it with. And is it, is it inside something, inside your head, or is it just happening in this same emptiness as the sounds are happening? So uh, you're, you're just paying attention to what it's like to be you. Are you inside something now? Not memory, or is everything in you? I say everything's in me. And uh, thoughts and feelings included. And this is the same for us all. So here we're aware of this indivisible consciousness. It doesn't have your name on it, or your address, or your nationality, or your gender. And yet you've got your own unique experience happening in it, I'm sure. I do. So this is as available with eyes closed as it is with eyes open. And if you open your eyes now, then the colors and shapes pop into the void. And you're still looking out of this, you are this emptiness, and your field of sensation is single, and the sounds are coming and going in, the, in this consciousness, and the, your thoughts and feelings are coming out. You don't have to stop thinking or anything. It's that's happening within the space. It's created. And so this is just uh, inviting us all to take a fresh look and, and recognize we've been kind of going by what we've been told we are uh, instead of what we actually experience ourselves to be. So now, of course, I'm aware of Richard. I'm aware of being just Richard. That's my appearance. That's my role in the, in the world. I take that seriously. But now I'm aware of privately, if you like, being this one consciousness that everyone is. And uh, th this is opening the doors, not closing them opening the door into a new life, really. So like, like I said at the, uh, at the start, it's always fresh. <laughs> 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 always faintly surprising. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
great to have a trick you can keep. <laughs> Never run down. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, uh, you're a member of the Psychedelic Society. I, 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 I don't take I, way back, you know, in, when I was 20 or something, I took them, but nowadays I don't for years and years and years. I'm happy with this, you know, and I'm too old for it anyway. But uh, you, I have come across the idea of microdosing. I, as I say, I'm not, I don't do it. But I, 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 I think you could apply that to the headless way. The headless way is microdosing, it's a quick shot. You, know, you keep you keep the headlessness going just by yeah just by you know you don't have to go and do a trip <laughs> you know, a retreat or something you know uh, which you'll come down from you just keep topping up <laughs> let's see if uh, governments find a way of making this illegal <laughs> i know i I mean, you wonder, because it does kind of hand the authority to each person. You think, well, this is not going to go down with some authoritarian regimes, I think. Yeah. But we'll work under the radar, you see. And <laughs> we, we, uh, we just, we, the grassroots thing, and by the time they discover it, it'll be too late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to erect monuments to the single eye. We should all worship the single eye. <laughs> <laughs> great thanks richard it's always thrilling to speak with you oh a delight a delight yeah a delight and if anyone's interested in joining our free zoom meetings you know if you're genuinely interested in this get in touch with me through the website or through amir and there's lots on the website and uh, youtube channel and so on <laughs>